Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. Before we get started, standard disclaimer, nothing you hear here is investing advice. Do your own due diligence. And today we have a very special guest on the program. He is the founder and former CEO of Sprott US Holdings and the CEO of Rule Investment Media, the legendary Rick Rule. Welcome to Commodity Culture. Jesse, thanks. I'm a fan. Thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. So I wanted to get started with the Rick Rule origin st story um, because I'm actually not aware of it. So how did you get started in investing and what attracted you specifically to the natural resources space? Uh, oddly, uh, I've been attracted to natural resources really since my mid-teens. Uh, I suspect but don't remember that that's because I like to be out of doors, uh, which is ironic because that led me to... Uh, uh, a profession trapped in an office for the last 50 years. <laughs> but I have been interested in investing and interested in natural resources as a subject since my mid-teens. Uh, I'm extremely lucky that I had the sort of discipline to pursue that. I went to the University of British Columbia, although I'm American. At that point in time, it was, as far as I know, the only degree-granting program in natural resource finance in North America. Uh, and uh, I mercifully, as a very young man, uh, fell into the right slot in life. And I've done effectively the same thing for my entire business career. Great. Well, I do want to jump into some specific commodities with you because I know everybody always wants to hear your take on the various sectors. But first, I wanted to tap into the wealth of knowledge you have on investing fundamentals. So I wanted to start with how you differentiate investing from speculating and how does one come to the conclusion whether they should be an investor or a speculator or could they do both possibly? I think that's a great question. Uh, and I, I think the most important thing that any investor can do is come to know himself or herself. <clears throat> uh, I, I think further, and I will answer the question, Jesse, I promise. Uh, I, I think further, the, the greatest risk any investor faces is conveniently located to the left of his or her right ear into the right of his or her left ear. Uh, and the question you ask is very appropriate. I define investments as an allocation of capital with the expectation of the probability of making uh, a suitable rate of return. I consider speculation uh, the taking of substantial risk uh, in anticipation of the possibility rather than the probability of outside returns. I have been for most of my life, both a speculator and an investor. I did it backwards from my point of view. Uh, I was a speculator first and an investor later. Uh, I got away with it. I was extremely lucky. I worked extremely hard. Most people I think should invest before they speculate, but of course the choice is theirs. Right, and I think a lot of people out there get involved with kind of a very lackluster form of individual security analysis when they'd probably be better off looking at the macro overview of a sector and investing in an ETF or something like that. You know, a lot of people think that security analysis entails listening to experts like yourself in interviews and just buying whatever stocks you mention. So could you talk about the kind of effort and knowledge required to analyze individual companies so maybe those new to the space can really understand what it takes? Absolutely. Uh, we need a couple more definitions now, beta and alpha. I define beta as the outperformance of the sector relative to the broad market. So if you suspect that natural resources or oil or something in a macro sense will outperform uh, broad equities markets, that outperformance by my definition, the delta is beta. Alpha is different. Uh, alpha is from my point of view, the outperformance of one company in a sector rather than the rest of the sector. When People seek to invest or speculate for their own account. Uh, I encourage them to limit the number of companies in their portfolio to the number of hours they plan to spend per month. So one company, one hour per month. If you have 10 companies in your portfolio, I believe that it is reasonable to expect to have to spend 10 hours per month. And by 10 hours a month, I don't mean however pleasant it might be, uh, listening to videos of Rick Rule discussing broad homilies uh, on commodity culture. I mean reading annual reports, reading quarterly reports, reading press releases, 
uh, reading 43-101s, uh, reading the proxy statements, uh, that kind of thing. What I found in my life is that most people would be their own best portfolio manager if they did it, but they won't do it. And for those people, uh, either people who don't have a large enough portfolio that it's irrational for them to spend the amount of time that would be required managing the, that portfolio, or for those people who have a life, they want to go to kids or grandkids baseball games, they want to fish, they want to read, they want to garden. In that circumstance, what you say is absolutely true. If you will do the work to outperform the market, you can outperform the market, but that presupposes that you are ready, willing, and able to do the work. In 50 years, 49 actually, uh, of assisting investors in managing their own money, what I've learned is that only a precious few are willing to invest in the education required to do the work and in turn, willing to do the work. Yeah, and for those who want to learn more about alpha and beta and how it relates to the natural resources space, I'd like to point them to a video on the Rural Investment Media channel where you discuss that at length. It's a, it's a great piece of education. So when it comes to individual security analysis in the commodity sector, for those who are willing to take the time, what are some of the main factors that one should be looking at when making an evaluation? I know this is going to vary depending on the stage, whether it's an exploration, you know, development or production stage. But what are some of the um, the main factors that that you take a look at for uh, natural resource companies? I think for most investors and speculators, uh, they haven't done enough work on investment fundamentals. Uh, I would begin by reading a very simple economics text called Economics in One Lesson, which from my point of view teaches the way the economy works uh, rather than the way that you were taught it works, assuming that you had the poor fortune like I to go to university and taught be taught mainstream mm -hmm. economics. Uh, having done that, by the way, it's an easy book to read. Uh, having done that, uh, I would suggest that you read uh the world's best investment primer, uh, which is in fact the Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham. I believe it's the best investment book ever written relative to the effort required to read it. Uh, it's important, however, that you read it. I probably caused 10,000 copies to be bought. Uh, I have no idea how many I've caused to be read. Uh, and if you are going to be serious about investing, then you need to read the magnum opus, uh, which is Securities Analysis by Graham and Dodd. Uh, it is a very hard book. It's a wonderful cure for insomnia. I never stop reading it. When I finish it, uh, I begin again at the beginning, just to remind myself of, about, uh, of the precepts uh, in the book. Once you have the basics down, then uh, I, I think the right way to do it is simply to begin to do, do it. I think you look at balance sheets and income statements, pick the company that's the biggest company in your portfolio. <laughs> I know this is going to sound daunting, but it's the way you learn how to do it. Get five years of annual reports and quarterly reports. If you get them uh, in paper, unstaple them so that you can lay them out and read the CEO's statement and mission and try to figure out whether or not that mission was fulfilled. Look at the interplay between investments that the company made and increases in book value per share <laughs> and increases in free cash flow per share. Try to determine uh, whether investments were made at the bottom of a commodity cycle when they should be made or at the top of a commodity cycle when they shouldn't be paid. Look at important ratios, particularly in pre-production company, like the proportion of total capital raised spent on general and administrative expenses uh, relative to project expenses. And if you're in early stage exploration companies, try to figure out if the management team is double dipping, which is to say getting paid to run the company and then being paid as a geological or marketing consultant on top. It's important to note whether or not your uh, investment or speculation is well run. Uh, it's important to note uh, whether your exploration company is a lifestyle company. Uh, uh, one more thing in this topic, if I may, Jesse, it, it's important to note among the juniors uh, that they're really a minefield. Uh, 
uh, I have made, by my standards, an insane amount of money in the juniors. But I've taken insane risk, and I've worked very, very, very hard. If you were to merge every junior mining company in the world, listed junior mining company in the world, the American listings, the Canadian listings, the London listings, the Australian listings, if you merged them all, maybe 2,500 companies into one company, called that company Junior Explore Co. In a good year, that company would only lose $2 billion. That is to say, expenditures over uh, receipts. In a bad year, it would lose six or seven billion dollars. So when you look at the sector as a whole, what are you willing to pay for a business that loses two billion dollars a year? Should you pay six times losses, 10 times losses? In a bull market, you might have to pay 15 times losses. That hides the fact that probably 5% of the issuers generate so much performance that they add legitimacy and occasionally luster to a sector that can be counted on destroying capital year after year after year. The point of all this is that if you're not going to do the work, don't get near the sector. Very sound advice. And I want to talk about time horizon as well, because this is something you stress a lot that a lot of investors these days are very impatient. They have trouble holding stocks over a long weekend, as, as you've mentioned. And a lot of people trade in and out of the market very frequently when they'd be better off holding on. Timing can also be tricky with commodities because of their cyclical nature. So how does one correctly calibrate their time horizon um, when it comes to investing in resource stocks? That's a that's that's a great question. You know, <laughs> it's odd that when I was a young man and had lots of time left on earth, I was very impatient. Uh, now that I'm an old man uh, and time is tight, uh, I've become very patient. It isn't that my time preference has changed. Uh, it's that I've lived through now 10 five-year cycles in my life. And I've learned that five years is a reasonable expectation to make real money. Compounding is the first wonder of the investing world, particularly in speculation. Uh, what I have learned is that making money in specula speculation, in, uh, in exploration, is really about answering a series of unanswered questions. Uh, and it isn't about just answering one. It's about answering three or four if you assume that every unanswered question re requires a new field season, you have to go through three or four or more field seasons. It doesn't mean that you have to own the stock for five years. In fact, if you discover that your expectations were wrong, <laughs> that it is unlikely that you're going to get a yes answer, you must sell the stock, whether or not you are up or down on it. But my experience and I've done some pretty serious work backtesting the 10 baggers, the thousand percent gains that I've enjoyed over my, my life. Uh, the median 10 bagger has required between five and six years. And by the way, the median 10 bagger, uh, at least once uh, in the course of holding it, has fallen by 50% or more in terms of price. So in, in addition to being patient, you have to be uh, very persistent. On the beta side of the business, that requires time too. Natural resource-based businesses, commodity-based businesses are capital intensive and cyclical. And they're a trap for somebody with conventional thinking. During periods of time when commodity prices are high and cash flows are high, earnings are high, very often the company's price earnings ratios are low. And we're, we're taught to think that low PE companies are valuable companies. But if the low PE is a consequence of abnormally high commodity prices, what happens is that commodity prices self-correct, meaning that you're setting yourself up for a trap where commodity prices collapse. What you need to do as a beta chaser, as an investor in natural resources, and this is really hard to do, you need to buy commodities that are so deeply out of favor that the industry is in or close to in liquidation. If you find a commodity where the global production cost is higher than the median price received for the commodity, you have a circumstance where either that commodity price goes up or the commodity itself becomes unavailable to consumption. The turnaround, uh, the time required for the market to work and the commodity to rise in price 
isn't something that happens in a quarter or a half or a year. In order to play this game, you very often need three to five years to be right. Now, a side note, there are certain circumstances where commodities sell off very, very, very dramatically due to other than permanent events. One example would be two and a half years ago, the COVID shutdown of the transportation industry that took the oil price from $80 a barrel to sub 20, all the way to sub zero for one weekend. That circumstance was very clear. It, it was very clear given that the oil industry was under investing in sustaining a new project investments by about a trillion dollars a year, that oil production wasn't going to be maintained and that the oil price would come back sooner than would otherwise be the case. And that of course happened. We round tripped <clears throat> that oil price decline in two and a half years. Don't consider this to be normal. Uh, hopefully COVID and circumstances like it won't become normal. But normally the timeframes required in either investing or speculating exceed the time frames that most people who are practitioners feel comfortable with. And that's just the fact of life. So I want to talk about jurisdiction a little bit. Um, you've pointed out before that most investors feel comfortable investing in jurisdictions where everyone looks like them and where the so-called rule of law seems to prevail, where things seem safe. However, you've also mentioned that some of the worst jurisdictional experiences you've had are in English speaking countries that are considered safe. So how do you balance jurisdictional risk between places that are quote unquote safe like Canada, but permitting times and government red tape can be absurd and places like Niger in Africa, where the country itself is very dangerous, you don't want to go there on vacation um, in terms of metrics like terrorism, kidnappings, general crime, but there are far less hurdles to building a mine. How, how do you look at those two different types of jurisdictions? I think you need to juxtapose political risk with technical risk. Uh, I would much rather have uh, a project like Kamoa Kakula in Congo, a, a tier one deposit. Uh, in a tier three country <laughs> than a tier three deposit in a tier one country. Very often, uh, the tier, the so-called good countries don't steal deposits because they aren't worth stealing. Uh, but what you see is that humankind everywhere is envious. The politician's job is to redistribute wealth. Uh, <laughs> and in every jurisdiction that I have ever been, Extractive industry uh, assets are attractive targets. As you point out, the worst experience with political risk that I ever had involved the Castle Mountain Gold Deposit in California, where I would argue that the legislatures deprived the shareholders of about 700 million U.S. dollars in net present value. Um, I was until fairly recently a property owner in the People's Republic of Vancouver where the BCC, the Vancouver City Council and the BC legislature uh, conspired to steal 5% of the assessed value of my real estate per annum. Uh, over four years, uh, in fact, they would have taken as much money as I had invested in the property. And yet people tell me that Canada doesn't offer up political risk. Uh, that seems to be interesting to me. I would suggest to you that people's concern about political risk becomes more narrative than arithmetic. Uh, I would suggest, as I you, you may have heard me before, say that for some reason, people prefer to be stolen from by white people in English, uh, according to the rule of law, uh, rather than lose their wealth by some more traditional method. Uh, having experienced both forms of theft, uh, I don't discriminate particularly by how my wealth is stolen. I have also found, and I learned this very early in my exploration career, a mentor of mine said, you succeed in exploration by applying old ideas in new places or new ideas in old places. If you're employing old ideas in old places, you're assuming that you're smarter than everybody that's come before you, which marks you as a fool. Uh, what that means is that the probability of discovering a really world-class deposit uh, is going to be higher in areas where fewer experienced people have looked with modern tools. 
So as an example, the entire Tethian metallogenic belt, some hard countries, many of them end in Stan. Uh, but if one was going to look uh, in tertiary volcanics for porphyries or epithermal gold deposits, probably the most fertile terrain <laughs> in the world. Uh, those wonderful Archean and Proterozoic belts in West Africa and Northern Africa, challenging sociological climates, challenging political climates? Absolutely. Uh, but where is one more likely to find a 10 million ounce gold deposit? Probably there. Uh, if you aren't willing to accept that, uh, I, I think you probably belong in the wrong place. By the way, I've been bit by political risk, too. Uh, I, a year ago, <clears throat> I guess, thought the Russian stocks were anomalously cheap and didn't believe that the world would be stupid enough to go to war. <clears throat> and I learned once again just how stupid people can be. Uh, <laughs> uh, mercifully, I invested money that I can afford to lose because it appears that I may have. So I also want to touch on management because that's something that's very important when evaluating a company. But I want to ask how your average small retail investor navigates those waters because bigger investors like yourself obviously can have more ready access to management, form relationships, get to have conversations with them. But for your average retail investor, we have maybe a bio on a website and some CEO interviews where, of course, they're just talking their book. So wh what's the best way for a retail investor to approach the management question? Is it better for them to place less emphasis on management or, or how would you say that the best way to navigate that is? It depends on the country, on the company. <clears throat> if the company is something like Exxon or Chevron or, or even Occidental, uh, while management's important, uh, you can do discounted net present value analysis. When you're in the exploration business, what you need to understand is that there are less asset businesses and more intellectual property businesses. So what you're buying is the intellectual property, and it damn well better be good. I would argue that most retail investors have better access to good managers than they think because the good managers are messianic. They want to talk about their business. They don't want to talk about baseball. They don't want to talk about politics. They don't want to talk about popular culture. They want to talk about their business. Those individual investors who go to an investment conference will be astonished that they can walk up to a Clive Johnson or a Ross Beatty or a Robert Friedland, uh, people who've built billion dollar fortunes in natural resources, uh, ask them a question and they won't be able to shut them up. That passion is one thing that sets apart the mediocre manager from the successful entrepreneur. What failing that I would do as an investor is I would get in touch with the IR person at an individual company and say, I want to know about prior successes uh, among the CEO and among the senior managers and also about directors. And I want to know particularly about uh, successes in the past that are immediately related to the task at hand. If the CFO is going to be caused to raise a bunch of money or secure production finance, has he or she done this before successfully? If the, if the task that the company is about is exploring uh, in accreted terrain in Chile or Peru for porphyries or epithermal gold deposits, does the exploration manager and does the CEO have a track record of success in that type of terrain, in that type of activity? If the prior success uh, involved operating, let's say a nickel mine uh, in French speaking Quebec, and the task at hand is exploring uh, in tertiary volcanics rather than producing for copper gold in Spanish speaking Peru, while the success is admirable, it isn't necessarily indicative of a skill set at the task at hand. And one of the things you'll discover when you ask the question of most companies, oh, they say, oh, well, we've never really thought of it that way. Uh, what that means is that they fail to think. Uh, and that's an extremely important strike against them. There are some entrepreneurs whose skill set involves matching properties with markets, with managers. Uh, if Robert Friedland calls me up and says, I'm going to explore for battery materials 
in, I don't know, pick a country, Bolivia. I'm inclined to listen. <laughs> I've done a lot of business with Robert over the years, and he's an amazing synthesizer of talents. The same thing uh, with the third generation of Lundines, uh, who learned at the, you know, uh, on the laps of their grandfathers and fathers. The same thing with Ross Beatty. But that sort of thing doesn't apply to mortals. Uh, most people that have had fewer successes, uh, you need to make sure that the successes that built their reputation are successes that are closely related to the task at hand. You've mentioned that the easy money, to the extent that it exists, is made from the big companies, the major producers. And yet this is an area that so many people consider boring. They have this idea that to make real money, you've got to speculate on developers or explorers. So could you discuss why having allocation to major producers and commodities is important? Well, first of all, I consider boring to be high praise indeed. Uh, if you consider the antidote to boredom as terror, uh, I prefer boredom to terror myself. Uh, but if you look at the incredible swings uh, in top of cycle versus bottom of cycle, free cash flows and valuations, what you'll see is that there is plenty of money to be made in the majors. Uh, companies like Rio and BHP tend to deliver three or 400% gains from the top of the cycle to the peak of the cycle. And by the way, while they're delivering these three or 400% gains, they're frequently paying five or six or 7% dividends. And so in terms of the time value of money, you don't have to discount them as hard because you're getting paid to wait. Um, people who want rates of return that are higher than that need to prepare themselves to do a lot of work, to be wrong fairly frequently, uh, and to suffer a lot of emotional turmoil if they haven't been in the racket as long as I have. Uh, there's also something to be said for the probability of a 300% return against the possibility of a 600% word return. Probable and possible are two very different phrases, and investors need to discuss need to discover for themselves who they really are. You know, I, I've talked to hundreds of people who believe themselves to be risk tolerant until they experience it, uh, who uh, profess to be patient until their patience is tested. <laughs> uh, it's okay if you discover that you're neither of those. What's not okay is to believe you are and find out you aren't and lose half your money. Yeah, that makes sense. So I had a guest named Ladislas Boris on the show recently. He specializes in investing in frontier markets, and he spoke about the possibility and the concern he has of governments capturing most of the upside in the commodity space through windfall taxes. Doug Casey has also discussed this as well. I don't know if that was what happened with your uh, – gold deal in California, if it had anything to do with that. But do you think this is a danger that investors in commodities should be factoring in and paying attention to? Absolutely. Not merely in frontier and emerging markets. What I have found is that the right time, if you have the nerve to invest in a country, is when everything has gone wrong. Uh, I remember myself uh, investing in Congo in 1995 during the Civil War. Two million people died there. You had AIDS, you had Ebola, you had warlords, you had a war. Uh, when something can't get worse, it doesn't. <laughs> it gradually recovered. I look as an example at the incredible mineral patrimony uh, of Bolivia. Uh, Bolivia, from a resource investor's viewpoint, has been through the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, I would argue the same is true with Venezuela. Uh, I look forward uh, in the speculative part of my portfolios to invest, well, not invest, that's the wrong phrase, speculate in Bolivia, to speculate in Venezuela. Uh, I tried speculating in Afghanistan once, 100% loss, <laughs> but I'm very, very, very willing to go back if the right people and the right assets presented themselves, of course, with money that I could afford to lose 100% of. So before I let you go today, I want to run through some sectors in the commodity space and get your thoughts on where they stand today. 
it can be rapid fire. You can expand on, on your thoughts, but I just wanted to get your thoughts right here as we sit here today. How does the uranium space look to you? I love it. Uh, uranium sells in the spot market for about 50 bucks. Costs about 60 bucks fully loaded globally to produce it. So the industry is producing, what, 135 million pounds a year, losing 10 bucks a pound, <laughs> trying to make it up on volume. The market is about to go from a spot market to a term market. Uh, a term market is very useful for producers because they can lock in cash flows and investors can understand how those cash flows are locked in. And they're going to lock in cash flows at higher prices. The deficit between production and consumption is, depending on who you listen to, 50 million pounds a year. The spot market was more than adequate, but two things have changed. My former employer, Sprott, came in and bought 55 million pounds to the extent that by now the spot market might actually be called the Sprott market, given the liquidity. But more importantly, uh, we've been through seven or eight years uh, eating up the surplus inventories. And now the cause of those excess inventories, the shutdown of the Japanese nuclear fleet, has been reversed. It's important to note that we use more uranium worldwide than we did before the Fukushima crisis. And now the Japanese nuclear fleet comes back online. This is a circumstance where the price increase is at once inevitable and imminent. Uh, if you'd asked me the question two years, I would say, I don't know when uh, the situation is going to reverse. Now I do. <laughs> now. How about uh, the oil and gas sector? I think the oil and gas sector is higher for longer. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the industry was deferring a trillion dollars a year in sustaining capital and new project capital. That number is down to $350 billion a year. Uh, if you defer sustaining capital, uh, and you defer new project uh, expenditure, you eliminate productive capacity. The combination of the fact that the industry is underinvesting in sustaining capital and that the big thinkers in the Western world, the Bidens and the Trudeaus and all those people, uh, are telling the industry at once to increase production, and oh, by the way, we're going to put you out of business in 2030, means that there isn't su sufficient uh, sustaining capital investments being made uh, to maintain production. I believe that peak oil demand on a global basis will occur in about 2045, which means we have 20 something years in front of us uh, in fossil fuels at surprisingly high margins. I do believe the easy money has been made in the oil and gas business. The move from $20 a barrel to $100 a barrel, now back down to 80, uh, was the easy money. But I suspect for income investors in particular, uh, buying companies that are generating enough free cash that they can make their sustaining capital investments while still paying decent dividends and or buying back shares, returning capital to investors, will do well for at least five years. Uh, and there is some number of them. It's important when you buy oil companies not just to buy the highest dividend. It's important that you do the work to understand that the company is making sufficient sustaining and new project expenditures that they can maintain productions, that they aren't capitalizing, uh, pardon me, decapitalizing themselves. That's very, very important. But I think the sector is wonderful for investors, maybe less so for speculators. And how about coal? Is there any opportunity there still? The most hated probably of all commodities. Um, is, is, does that sentiment lead to an upside or, or is that ship pretty much sailed? I, I think the uh, opportunity in coal is probably for private equity investors. Those of your investors who are able to do that, there are still a lot of coal assets for sale uh, and decapitalizing the coal sector privately I think is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, what you've seen is spectacular, spectacular uh, performance in the coal sector. And what I think you're going to see is that gradually met coal assets worldwide are going to be are, are going to come to be bought by capital pools from the companies that consume it. Uh, countries like India, countries like China, who listen politely and mouth kind words to the World Economic Forum. Uh, but really couldn't give a damn. Uh, they are interested in industrializing their economies, urbanizing their economies, and allowing their citizens to enjoy the same lifestyle that you and I enjoy. Now, of course, have to touch on the monetary metals, gold and silver. Where, how do you see them? Where, where do they stand today? 
I, I think people are crazy not to own gold. Uh, I'm not saying it has to go up, but I am saying that if you look at the value proposition around savings and investment instruments denominated in fiat, and you don't feel the need to insure that you look at the world very differently than me. I own a lot of gold. I hope it goes down in price, not up. Uh, the things that make the gold price do well uh, does deleterious things to my lifestyle. My lifestyle is very good, thank you. I regard it as an insurance asset. I also note that if the gold price went from 16 and change to 23 or 24, I wouldn't be a seller. If the gold price went from 16 and change to 15 and change, I'd be a buyer. It's actually in my interest to see the gold price lower. Uh, I know that less patient people would feel differently, but that's their problem. Uh, I also note that the uh, industry on a net present value uh, using the uh, strip price and the spot price uh, as the valuation metric is the lowest relative to enterprise value in my career, uh, which is to say, not only is the gold price attractive to me, but the gold companies are showing a, a newfound interest in efficiency that I've never seen before in my career, which makes them better buys. Finally, the industry is underestimated in exploration and development for about 30 years. Uh, and those lucky juniors or skilled juniors that come on a, a tier one asset will be able to sell those assets for eye-popping prices to majors that are in effect liquidating their reserves. On the silver side, I would suggest that it's a speculator's metal, uh, and I'm a speculator, so I like it too. I don't like it as much as gold uh, because I've already achieved what I need to achieve through speculation. In my life, gold needs to establish the primary trend before silver responds. Silver is a late cycle responder, it tends to move further and faster when it moves. Uh, I would also note that the population of real silver stocks is so small that when the money from the general equities community flows into the silver narrative, there literally is not enough market cap to contain it. Doug Casey describes the, the result as attempting to siphon Hoover Dam through a garden hose. Uh, I've experienced this several times in my career. And I'm looking forward at age 69 to experiencing it one more time. <laughs> and finally, I want to ask if there's any commodities you see right now that are attractive that maybe not enough people are paying attention to, but could provide a great amount of upside in the years ahead. I think platinum probably rebalances against palladium. Uh, I think that palladium had more manufacturing uses because it was cheaper than platinum <laughs> and that that's turned around. I do buy, uh, ultimately, uh, the whole story around the electrification of the planet. Not so much for me as an electric vehicle play, but rather the fact in every aspect of our life, electricity pay, plays a larger role, and the fact that 1.2 billion people on Earth have no access to electricity. So I continue to be attracted to nickel, particularly sulfide nickels. I believe that the copper business will do very well, although I suspect it might be interrupted in its ascent uh, by the possibility of recession uh, or depression. But the truth is, uh, Jesse, rather than focus on commodities, what I really like to focus on is big deposits, irrespective of the commodity they produce. Uh, a minimum of $10 billion in recoverable in situ reserves and resources at today's commodity prices, 40 is much better than 10. Uh, best quartile in the world in terms of all in sustaining costs and best quartile in the world in terms of return on capital employed. What I found my life in my life is I can make an awful lot of money on boring stuff. If I own the best boring stuff, what's important to me is return on capital employed, winning the last man standing contest, which is to say uh, having a deposit that can be mined relatively inexpensively. Uh, and having the production profile measured in decades so that I can live through various cycles. That's what's more important to me than the name of the commodity that gets produced.
Well, thank you for so much for joining us today, Rick. Huge wealth of knowledge shared. Um, for those who want to hear more from you, where is the best place to find you online? Is it the the Rule Investment Media YouTube channel or? Yeah, I want um, to give your people an incentive. Uh, okay. Go to Rule Investment Media. If you like what I have to say about resources and care about what I have to say about your portfolio, ask me. Go to ruleinvestmentmedia.com, list your natural resource stocks. Please no crypto, please no tech, please no psychedelics or pot stocks. Uh, leave an old guy to what he does well. I'll rank them one to 10. Uh, I'm also celebrating retirement, as you may know, by starting a new bank, uh, a bank that will lend, among other things, against precious metals. If you want to learn more about a real bank, an old-fashioned bank with money in it that lends against real collateral, in the question and comments section, write bank. If you're an accredited speculator and care about private placements, I've learned that since I'm not a broker anymore, I can tell you what I'm doing in private placements with my own money. No charge for the service yet. There may be someday. If you're an accredited investor and you care about private placements and natural resource investments, at the question and comment section uh, in the rural investment media uh, database, write in placements. So that's ranking bank placements. Great. I'll put a link to that in the description below so people can check it out. I've submitted my portfolio to you before, and it was very instructive and educational. So I do encourage people to do that. And thank you so much and hope to have you on again in the future to continue the conversation. I look forward to it, Jesse. This uh, uh, investor education mentoring is uh, what gives an old guy pleasure. I enjoy doing it. So thank you for the opportunity. This is the Uranium Element Cube from Engineered Labs. They're a sponsor of the program now. And the reason why is because... I genuinely love this product. I've always wanted to get real uranium in my hands, and that's what this is. That crystal in there is 50% uranium by weight. The acrylic shield surrounding it reduces the radiation emitted to a very low level that is completely safe. Uh, Engineered Labs also ships worldwide, which is great. The products are made in the USA, and if you use my discount code COMMODITIES at checkout, you'll receive a 10% discount on your order and you will be supporting this program. The Uranium Element Cube link is in the description below. And now, back to the program. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.